Welcome to episode 108 of All About Fitness. With this podcast, I try to do episodes that are evergreen, meaning you can listen to them any time of the year or later on in future years. But for this episode, what I'm doing is I'm doing a little tribute to some of the most important people in our lives. That's right, it's Mother's Day week. So for Mother's Day 2018, I'm going to pay a little tribute here to those women who do a lot of work. Whether you're a spouse, a son, a daughter, you know that at some point a mother has played a significant and very important role in your life. It's important to remember that parenthood is not a solo sport. It really isn't. Being a parent is actually one of the toughest challenges we will ever face. And that's not to say that it's a negative experience. In fact, it's completely the opposite. You know, for me, and I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes the hardest part about being a parent is that when I see my kids pushing back, when I see my kids, you know, kind of breaking the rules a little bit, that makes me happy. I want my kids to be independent thinkers. I want them to to kind of do things for themselves. I want them to make some mistakes. I want them to, to find out, you know, just how to make things happen on their own. We try to establish rules and you know what? Sometimes you got to push the rules a little bit. But then as a parent, I need to remember, no, my job is to teach them boundaries. My job is to teach them how to get along. And that if you want to be an active member of society, of a family, of anything, that you need to conform to what the expectations are. So that's kind of where, for me, some of the challenges of parenthood come in. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It just is, I want to foster that creativity. Yet at the same time, I also want to teach them how to be a part of the greater good. You know, I was a kid, when I was a kid growing up, I was definitely very independent. I, I pushed back quite a bit. I didn't always like being told what to do. Sometimes it worked out well for me. Other times, well, let's just say, now that my kids are in elementary school, sometimes when I go into the office to do something, I always feel like I'm there in trouble, like I'm going to be getting a stern talking to from the principal when all I'm really there is just do some paperwork or take care of something for one of the kids. But just walking into a school office still brings back some uh, interesting memories for me. You know, here's the thing about parenthood. We're all just kind of making up as we go along, aren't we? You know, yeah, there are some resources about, you know, cognitive, emotional, and motor development, as well as suggestions from the quote-unquote experts about what we should and should not let our little angels do. But I know that if you have young kids, there have been times when you just give them your phone or give them your iPad or stop by that fast food place and, you know what, you're getting them just something just to kind of occupy them a little bit so you can get a few minutes of peace and quiet. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Come on, folks, let's face it. That occasional fast food meal for our kids is not going to harm them in the long run. And if it gives you 15 minutes of peace and quiet while they play whatever piece of you know plastic comes in a little box along with a bad burger and crappy fries, well, you know what? You deserve that 15 minutes. But one of the most important things about being a parent is having a sense of community of having friends and neighbors that who you can share experiences with. Maybe you plan activities together. And this is where exercise, which is my area of specialty, this is where exercise can play an important role because it creates opportunities for social interaction, whether you're a new parent or whether your kids are getting ready to get out of high school and maybe move on to that next phase of life. Let's face it, exercise time is a chance where you can reach out and just communicate and connect and be with other people going through shared experiences. One of the things I love right now about a couple of the classes that I teach is just being there. You're there with a lot of other people about the same age, and they're all going through you know, the experiences. I have a couple of women taking a couple of classes I teach right now who are getting ready to have their first kid. And it's really fun to see how other women in the class are connecting with them and sharing advice and giving tips and everything. Sometimes it's solicited, sometimes unsolicited. You know, but being active together is a great way to strengthen existing friendships. It's also an excellent way to build new ones. And if you're a family, finding opportunities to be active as a family, whether you go for a walk, you go to the playground, you you go out to the park, that's your role, that's your job as a parent to establish those healthy behaviors, to check to set those healthy habits up. So for this episode of All About Fitness, you know, I want to pay tribute to mothers and I want to also pay tribute to the families because yes, mothers play a very important role, but it's a whole family. And if you're a single parent, you know, you have a network of friends. You have people that, that you're working with as well who I know are very important for you. So there's a lot of resources. The last few years, a lot of resources have been created. One of the greatest things about this online world that we, we now live in is that we have other resources. My guest today is Sarah Lynn Ward. 
She herself is a mother of two young children. And she realized that she needed to do, she, she was having some questions. She was having some issues about where can I get support? Where can I get some ideas? And so she sought to create a solution through a blog called The Mama Sagas. On this episode of All About Fitness, Sarah Lynn Ward and I talk about what role does community play in motherhood. And then we also speak quite a bit about what role does exercise and activity play in families. You know, activity, exercise time is a very important part for parents of young kids because it's a chance for you to kind of leave your kids with a stranger. Yeah, I know that sounds weird. You drop them off in the play area at the, at the gym, but it's a chance for you just to be yourself for an hour, to get a little break from everything. And it's also a chance to connect and communicate and just be an adult again for an hour. After a brief word from the sponsor of All About Fitness, it's a pleasure to sit down and have a discussion with Sarah Lynn Ward, the creator of the Mama Sagas blog. What is part bench, part balance trainer, part stability ball, part jump box, and all results? The TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, specially designed to help enhance balance, strength, agility, and metabolic conditioning. The TerraCore is quickly becoming the go-to piece of workout equipment used by fitness professionals around the world. Whether you're training to earn that eight-figure contract or just trying to get in better shape, the TerraCore will help you achieve results you never thought possible. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, the shape of things to come. Go to www.vicorefitness.com and use code AAF, that's all about fitness, AAF, to save 20% on the purchase of a TerraCore. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness, and I'm speaking today with Sarah Lynn Ward. Sarah Lynn, can you give us a little bit of background about what you do and and kind of uh, the the role that you're playing right now? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on today. I really appreciate the opportunity, Pete. Um, My brand is called The Mama Sagas. Um, I have arrived here at this point in my career very in a very unique way, and I feel very... um, proud of the fact that I've had a very diverse career leading up to now. So I have 12 plus years in the fitness industry as primarily a Pilates instructor as well as group fitness instructor. Um, I was also an editor and brand manager for an online fitness resource. That kind of parlayed into a writing career and a career in media as well. So I now at this point in time have combined all of that experience into my role as the editor of the Mama Sagas. And the Mama Sagas is a brand that celebrates the raw and perfect beauty of motherhood and provides two basic things that I always felt was lacking, were lacking for moms, which are number one, community in a non-judgmental, inclusive kind of environment. And then number two, expert solutions and quick palatable advice um, that was research-based, but delivered in a way that was understandable and approachable and non-intimidating. Well, let me ask you that. We were just talking about this before we hit record. Um, I think our kids are about the same ages. My older daughter is about to turn six, and my younger Uh daughter turns four this year. What what are the ages of your kids? Yeah, I have a five-year-old. She just turned five last week, and a two-year-old. Okay, so yeah, relatively same, relatively same area. Do you think there is, you know, just do you think there's a lot of judgment on new moms for in that first year? What are some of the pressures? I've seen it as a as a husband and a father. But what are some of the pressures that a new yeah. mom, and, and some is probably underlisting it by a lot, but, yeah. but what, what's it feel like as a new mom in that first year? Well, and I want to be clear, you know, judgment can come in many forms. There can be judgment from external sources and there can be plenty of internal judgment too. Moms, I think that the level of mom guilt that new moms feel um, is something you can't really comprehend until you get to be a mom. It's so interesting how quickly that mom guilt descends because what I always say is parenting is the highest stakes game out there. I mean, we all want to do the best we can do and raise our children in the best way possible. But the the reality is none of us know what we're doing. So, (laughs) you know, everyone, you could seek out the advice of as many experts as you want, but in the end, you have to trust your instinct to know what is right with your child. And I think because there's so many voices trying to chime in and say, you know, Rest is best or, you know, 
vaccinate or don't vaccinate or whatever, all of these different polarizing conversations happen. It can be a sea of advice, either solicited or unsolicited, that can be overwhelming for moms. And and it can be hard to listen to our own instinct and trust the research um, because, you know, there's also just a lot of it out there. And so it's hard to know if, if what the information you're getting is trustworthy or if it's based in science. And so it can be very tricky. It's um, I think what new moms need the most is a village of people around her that support her in her decision to seek out the information that will empower her to make the best decision for her family. And that's going to look different from family to family, but also child to child. As you know, with two kids, I mean, the two kids are so different from one another. What works for one might not work for another, you know? And I'm, just, I'm just giggling about that. Yeah. Because they both came from the same place, but they, uh, yeah, are extremely different. And, and I think that was our experience as new parents was that you do feel this pressure to, we have to spend the money to get the best, get the best. You know, you have to do right. this, you have to buy this, you have to buy that. And what I've told friends of mine now, I'm like, look, the only thing you want to buy new is maybe a car seat and a crib. Everything right. else is going to get destroyed. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yeah, especially if you have boys. I mean, you know, it just is, you know, not, don't, you want to be safe. And especially where, I mean, the tough thing is, you know, and I don't think that many in this audience might be new, new parents. But the tough thing is, I think all along is you're trying to make, I, I like the fact that we're all trying to make the best decisions. Because, right. you know, there are some days where I'm like, you know what? my goal is just to keep you alive for the day. Let's, 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 let's keep, <laughs> I, I try to break it down at that. And obviously, you know, you do some stuff, but there, there are times when you're like, you know, how should you, is there any suggestions for how to feel with kind of that guilt? Cause I have it sometimes. Yeah. You know, if I have the kids alone in, in the evening while my wife is out, you know, I'm sometimes it's very easy to use the iPad or use a TV. And mm-hmm. I tell myself, you know, I, okay, I didn't grow up too warped from watching, you know, watching TV. So it's not that bad for that short of a time. Right. Yeah. I think it really comes down to picking your battles. And every day that choice that you make of which battle you're going to pick is going to be different because every, I I think the best thing that a parent can do to try to relieve some of the guilt is to be flexible and to be uh, forgiving of yourself because you're, first of all, like I said, no one knows what they're doing. Number one, number two, we're all doing the best that we can. And number three, what we think works might not work next time. And it might not work, you know, the time after that. And you have to be able to adapt to the situation in front of you. And what that requires of you in that moment is going to be different. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got from my sister-in-law who has three kids um, was that, you know, she was like, I always used to tell my oldest child, I, this is the first time I've ever been a, a mom. I, I'm, mommy's new at this. Mommy's just learning. So you're going to have to bear with me as I try to figure it out, just like you're trying to figure out all the rules of being a kid. So I think <laughs> that's, I think but, that's but, important. <laughs> but I think that candor, I think that candor, I think kids, you know, from what I've seen, kids appreciate honesty. And one of the things that I want to ask you is, you know, what was what was your biggest surprise about being a, being a mother, Sarah Lynn? Like, what was the thing right. that you just were like, you, that you, even though you thought you try to get, and no one can be ready. It's such a change no. in your life that you cannot. There really is no way to prepare. But what was the, the one kind of like? Oh man, this is a lot different than I thought. Yeah, actually, there were a couple big things. Um, first of all, the thing that no one ever prepares you for or tells you about. I think for women in particular is the identity shift that comes with being a parent. All of a sudden, you just you're almost immediately, as soon as you meet your child for the first time, your priorities shift, your perspective shifts. I I remember feeling like this, like your heart is walking around on the outside of your body. Hmm. You feel so much more vulnerable. You feel like the, the concerns and the worries that you had about maybe the world or, you know, just your lifestyle in general, those things are amplified so quickly because you, you now have this little child that's relying on that, you know, but then for women in particular, I think, you know, the way that we interact at work, the things that we do and, you know, for fun, I, the one thing that I always remember feeling is like, I no longer have time for bullshit. And I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast or not, (laughs) but that, but that's how I felt. It's like, you know, I wanted to go to work, get my job done. I was way more efficient. And then I needed to leave and get out of there so I could go be a mom. I didn't have time to like be sitting in a meeting that was going nowhere and people were just, you know, wasting time. It's like, you don't have that luxury anymore to waste time. So I think that was one thing that was really shocking to me. The other thing 
with my background in health and wellness, I was so shocked at the lack of information out there about how a woman's body changes after she gives birth. And I don't mean just, you know, a few extra pounds. Of course, that is relevant too, but the pelvic floor changes so much. The um, abdominal separation is very likely for most women. Um, and especially after you've had, you know, multiple pregnancies or even a birth, one birth with multiple children. So it's just very, all of that information, I think that is now starting to become more um, common. It, when I was you know, five years ago, even just giving birth to my first child, it wasn't as easy to access or to find. And so I was shocked that no one prepared me for that. Well, um, and it was kind of when, when my wife was pregnant with, with number one back in 2012, it kind of, she was teaching a couple nights a week at one health club in downtown San Diego. And it, a couple other women came up to her and actually started taking her class because they were pregnant as well. And they, they, they told my wife that they felt kind of empowered, not empowered, but just encouraged exercise during their pregnancy and I mm -hmm. have video and I'm sure you probably do the same thing but I have a video of my wife teaching like the last week of her pregnancy right before you know because she was kind of like she wanted to do it. we've had friends and I'm sure you've had two or instructors that that taught right up until the end so this becomes I don't really understand it but it becomes like kind of this badge of honor but it'd be kind of funny Sarah mm -hmm. because like, I'd be on the other side of the gym working out and I'd watch people walk by the studio and they would kind of stop they'd stare at my <laughs> wife and then they bring like point to bring a friend over and like because she'd be teaching with like just you know she was you know nine months pregnant. Yeah, but, was, yeah, same. <laughs> but she developed, but she developed this friendship, and and even though a couple that you know a couple of the moms moved away, and you know as things happened for the first year and a half, two years, they were really close. Especially for that first year, they would my my wife would organize walks at least once a week, and everybody mm -hmm. would get together and go on like little walks and workouts. How, what role does fitness play in that first year? I mean, how does yeah. that? And I don't mean just from a physiological standpoint. And we'll talk about that. But more because right. you talk about your blog, Building Community, what role does fitness play in building that community? It, it's huge. I think and I like to look at fitness in the first year as an opportunity to have some me time. This is how I view it personally, but it's an opportunity for me to have me time. So for me, you know, a lot of times if I was going to a class or um, working out with a friend, somebody that I really enjoyed being around and had that company, uh, having that company with, that would also build me up and fulfill me and provide that sense of community and support that I was so needing at the time. So I think fitness can play several different roles. The other thing that I think is so important to, to express for new moms, and especially moms who are maybe pregnant and are looking ahead to that postpartum period, what you expect of yourself has to change in that first year. It's so, um, you kind of feel like you're walking into this dark room and you have no idea where the light switch is. Like there's no, there's no way of knowing what your body's going to feel like after birth because you don't know what the trauma of labor is going to entail for your body until you're in that moment. And then almost inevitably, everyone I've talked to who's had a child is shocked by how, um, how different their body feels right after. And one of the things that was surprising for me, I breastfed both of my children. Um, and the first time around I did a whole year and I didn't feel like my body was familiar and felt like it was back to where it was, it was prior to being pregnant until after I was done breastfeeding, because those hormones are still in your system. You still have relaxant in your body, pumping through your body while you're breastfeeding. So there's not a lot of, you know, information out there that supports women in, th in realizing that the journey, the postpartum fitness journey is going to be very different um, and than, it, than her fitness journey ever has been before. And I think starting slow and small and building up, you know, walking right away, movement is good. So as soon as you have the baby and you can walk around, you should be walking as much as possible. When your doctor finally gives you the clearance to exercise, you need to start small. Don't just jump right back into things because you can actually do more damage if you just jump right back in. So think of it, I like to think of it as a blank slate. So it was hard for me being a fitness professional after giving birth to feel like I had no strength. I had no endurance. I was winded. I felt like my body was still healing and still recovering. And I had to change my mindset and I had to tell myself, you know what, think of it as a blank slate so that you're starting from square one. Sure. But you can rebuild it to be anything you want it to be. So you just have to start laying the foundation in those early weeks and early months for the kind of 
fitness that you want to have going forward. And then, you know, before you know it, you're back to doing the things you were doing before and it might feel entirely different. I mean, I like to tell the story about how I could never do a pull up prior to having my first child. And then with that mentality of the blank slate, I rebuilt my strength in such a way that I was able to not completely unassisted, but I was able to do pull-ups um, with just a very light resistance band as support afterwards. And I had never been able to do that before. So I think, you know, there, you can redefine what fitness means for yourself and redefine what your body is capable of doing. Um, and you might just surprise yourself. I think the important thing is not to compare yourself to where you were before because your body is different. Well, and the one thing that comes to mind, Sarah Lynn, is, you know, how did giving birth, um, how did that change your perspective about your body? Because you talk about starting with a clean slate. Did, did that give you more confidence in what your body was capable of? Yeah, it did. I think it took me a few months to get to that point because, you know, when you're in the thick of that postpartum recovery period, um, it's easy to focus on all the things that you feel like you've lost in a fitness from a fitness perspective. Um, but I think, you know, the second time around was much different for me because I knew that I was able, I was going to be fine. I knew I was going to be able to get back the strength. I knew I was going to be able to get back the mobility and the endurance and the capability to do the things that I was doing prior to being pregnant. So I wasn't as concerned with it the second time around, but the first time for sure, I think, um, you know, giving birth is a very empowering event. And, um, and I should also, you know, it's a little different when a mama has a C-section that can be traumatic to some people because maybe she wasn't expecting it and, you know, she didn't get the birth experience that she wanted and it doesn't feel as empowering to some people. Um, so I think it's also important to recognize that everyone's birth experience will leave them with a different feeling going out of it. So especially for fitness professionals, you know, I think it's important to have the conversation with your clients about what that experience was like for them, because they'll be coming back into, you know, the gym or the fitness studio or the yoga studio with, um, with carrying that feeling of whether or not it was an empowering event or whether or not it felt disempowering. And so I think that that will very much shape the fitness journey going forward, you know? Well, and one thing that you you some mentioned earlier, and it kind of occurred to me, and, and I'm going to talk about this for a second, because I have noticed in a couple of classes I teach over the last maybe year, year and a half, I've spoken with a couple you know, younger women, whatever they are, they're maybe late 20s, early 30s, I don't really know the age. In my opinion, Sarah Lynn, everybody in the gym looks about the same age. You put your hair, uh-huh. you, know, you put your hair back in a ponytail, you're wearing workout clothes. You're all late 20s, early 30s, regardless of what your age is. <laughs> yeah. Everybody looks almost the same. And um, But I've talked to a couple of young women who have experienced diastasis recti, and it you know, occurred to me they're a little bit more probably on the petite side. They're obviously, they're fit, they're strong. And I think, you know, my and, and for, for listeners, that's when you, the abdominal muscles separate. You have mm-hmm. um, a right and a left, your rectus abdominis, which attaches from your rib cage to your pelvis, isn't necessarily upper and lower, but you have two separate bands of muscle connected by fascia in the middle and during birth that fascia can separate and so you have the two bands of muscles that separate what you know is there anything you know as as a pilates instructor in in just from your experience is that has that been something you've seen among fit women among the fit population yeah and are you asking in terms of like more in terms of the fit population? yeah i would say more that's what kind of comes to mind exactly sarah is like have, have you noticed that like you know, where I, just, I don't know if I'm asking the question right, but I would imagine that a stronger, fitter woman might experience that more as opposed to someone who maybe didn't exercise as often or as frequently. Yeah, you know, I don't know the I don't know that I have the answer from a research perspective, but in my own personal anecdotal perspective, I would say yes. In a lot of ways, being fit, really fit prior to giving birth can sometimes be an interesting challenge. And it was for me, in fact. So uh, just like I said, I was a Pilates instructor for years, right? So I, every single day I was doing Pilates and my pelvic floor as a result was extremely tight. And I didn't realize how 
tight it was until I was in labor. And all of a sudden I got to six centimeters of dilation and I plateaued. My body was like not able to release and let go the rest of the way. Mm. And so I had gone in thinking, you know, I didn't think I would avoid an epidural, but I knew that it was going to be something that would be like at the, you know, a last resort type thing. So my OBGYN came into the room and she said, you know, I really think that an epidural would help you because it would help you relax and you would probably dilate much quicker. And sure enough, I got the, an epidural and within 30 to 45 minutes, I was ready to push. It was like (laughs) that quick. And so that kind of set me off on this journey of exploring the pelvic floor more because I felt like there's a lot of information out there that women don't have. So after the birth, my pelvic floor was really a wreck. And I, um, I, I was, you know, I noticed a lot of hip issues as a result. I had a really tight piriformis. Um, and, and so I ended up doing a little research and found that my insurance would cover pelvic floor physical therapy Hmm. as part of my physical therapy benefit. And so I found a provider in Boulder, Colorado. It was pelvic, um, pelvic floor special, pelvic therapy specialists, I think is what they're called. Um, and so I started going there once a week. Um, and I just paid my copay. I had like a $15 copay and I went through pelvic floor PT and it literally changed my life. I can't, I cannot express how important it was for me to do that. Not only after having a child, but because I didn't understand the pelvic floor before that. I didn't understand my own body and how it was impacting my own body. So it was really interesting um, to realize that, yes, exercising is great and being fit is always advised, but there are, you know, unique challenges that come along with that when you're giving birth. And so back to your question about diastasis, I do feel like in my Pilates practice, the people who had the most challenge um, in terms of recovering from their diastasis were people who were very fit ahead of time. Um, and again, like I said, that's anecdotal. That's not necessarily research supported. Um, but I feel like, you know, runners, if you think about what often exacerbates a diastasis, it's rotation and it's flexion. So, and, you know, putting a lot of pain or a lot of strain on the um, abdominal wall in something like a plank, you know, women who have been doing those types of exercises their whole life, that's naturally what they're going to want to gravitate to when they come out of that postpartum period. However, they're going to have to really show some restraint and, you know, back off. I mean, Pilates was very different for my clients who had diastasis than it was for, you know, anyone else who was not pregnant or postpartum. Um, it was a lot different kind of stabilization work and, um, rebalancing the muscles and kind of realigning the body, getting the muscle firing patterns back in order. Not so much like heavy core work is like what you would think Pilates is, you know? And and that's interesting because yeah I think a lot of people wouldn't would anticipate that and yeah I would agree a thousand percent Sarahlyn that anecdotal it's just that observation because I don't know if anybody out there would you know any researcher would really kind of be aware of that I think that's much more of a practitioner observation that we've yeah. seen that and so just something to to kind of key I, into now let's go I, back I want to sorry go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, I noticed a lot of diastasis in runners in particular, people who are very, um, very, very fit runners. Also, you know, swimmers, um, that rotation aspect again of the movement that often contributes. So, and you know, that, and that's, I mean, people have to be very mindful of that because when something like that, that happens, your body needs time to heal. And I think mm-hmm. that's, you know, I think all exercisers, we all have that, you know, we need to do a much better job of that overall. Now I want to come back to, to your blog, the mama sagas. Why'd you pick the name? You know, I, you have a little huh. bit of, you have a little bit of information in there and I think it's a really, yeah. uh, I think it's a very cool explanation, but, but why, why, why'd you call it the mama sagas? Yeah. Well, besides the fact that it sounded cool, <laughs> um, this, a saga is a heroic narrative. And for me, I felt like I wanted to redefine what it meant to be a super mom. You know, we have this notion um, in our society of what a super mom is, and she's balancing all these things and multitasking. And, and that can be really exhausting. I'll be honest. You know, it's like, that's kind of where some of that mom guilt comes from is like, you have to be everything to everyone and do everything perfectly all the time. And to me, I wanted to redefine what a super mom is. And a super mom is someone who owns her story and owns her experience, who is honest and upfront about the challenges she faces and is forgiving of herself in light of those challenges. 
And so I wanted to take that idea of a heroic narrative and apply it to motherhood. So the Mama Saga's blog is a lot of first person accounts of motherhood told through Um, you know, women sharing their stories in their own voices. So for me, what I do as the editor of the blog, I, I reach out to moms who I think have a great story. They also reach out to me. They either write it, but I also didn't want writing to be um, an obstacle or a barrier to entry. So I also will interview women and I'll transcribe, transcribe their interview into a blog post or an essay. And And then, sorry, but one of the things I've noticed is that you have a lot of videos on there. Is that, is that mm -hmm. part of the process? Yes. So then the second half of the Mama Sagas is the solutions content that I like. I like to call it the solutions content. So a lot of those are video format um, and it's expert advice from women's health experts, pediatric experts as well. And there are videos that are like two to three minutes in length that explain certain concepts. Like one of them is how to do a proper Kegel. One of them is about diastasis and how to do a self-assessment of diastasis. One of them is about, uh, there's a lot of breastfeeding videos actually, Um, I also have a formula feeding expert that I consult on a regular basis. She's a a doctor in perinatal nutrition and she's just, I feel like her work is so important because again, I like to be inclusive of all parenting styles and I understand the challenges that come with breastfeeding and not everyone's able to do it. So I want to make sure that we're representing what parenting looks like across the board for everyone. And, and that's that's cool to hear. And do you do anything on there? I mean, I, we asked, we talked about this briefly before uh, before we hit, we hit record. What about the fathers? I mean, you know, as yeah. as a dad, I think one of the challenges is you know we feel like we want to be a part of it, but I think the the mother sometimes gets so like hyper organized, hyper into that that there's sometimes a miscommunication there about things. So, what advice would yeah. you have for for dads or how to communicate with husbands? Yeah. Well, number one for the moms, I think the most important thing, everyone's going to tell you ask for help, right? But a lot of times it's hard to know you need help until you're totally overwhelmed and already going down that path of resentment. (laughs) So I would say number one is accept help. Um, Not just ask for it, but accept it. So, you know, be okay with the way that your husband or your partner handles things because a lot of times moms do, they get, they get used to, you know, and, and let me backtrack a little bit. There is a biological response that is also in play here. So in the cave, moms who were breastfeeding, breastfeeding and taking care of a newborn, they had, there was a, there's a heightened level of anxiety and it's a survival mechanism that we have from way back when. So that is normal. It's normal for moms to want to, um, they call it perseverate. They like being on top of everything all the time, always wanting to make sure that things are done exactly right. Taking care of the baby, answering every single cry, that anxiety is built into, to our biology. So number one, it's recognizing that and understanding that that's something that we're going to have to deal with. Now, on the other hand, the rational brain can also help you accept help. So if your partner wants to help, we need to give them space to figure out what works for them. I think it's really hard because, you know, we know what works for us in terms of calming a crying baby, but dad or your partner, they need to figure that out for themselves. And so giving them the space to develop a relationship with the baby is so important. Well, and I think, sorry, but I just kind of chime in there. I think sometimes it's, you know, from, from my perspective, just from, from watching it, I, you know, my advice would be to, you know, to a, a mother that, that feels a little bit like that is let us know, because a lot of times it seems like you might have, you know, it seems like my wife has everything handled. I'm like, oh, well, she has everything handled. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what she needs. Like if I try to do something, I'm like, I don't need you to do that. I'm like, well, tell me what you need. You know, she, yeah. it's just like, I don't have that ESP. Um, if I could read minds, I'd be doing something much different and we'd be living a much different lifestyle. But, yeah. you know, it really is, I, I just, sometimes I, I want to do something and I, you know, taking out the trash. Okay. That stuff is all well and good, but I, I can't read minds. So I do need somebody to communicate, you know, what you need me to do. And I'm more than yeah. happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a very, very good point. I think women need to speak up about that. Like I said before, recognizing that the path of, you know, being overwhelmed and falling into that resentment trap well before it happens, I think is really important for dads. I would say the best thing that they can do is be proactive and 
don't wait for her to ask for help. Just jump in, say, I'm taking the baby for an hour. And one of the things that always gets frustrating for moms, I think, is like, you know, as soon as the baby starts really crying and is inconsolable, they'll they'll want to hand the baby back to mom to breastfeed or to calm the baby or do whatever. But it's like, you know, bear it, bear with the baby for just that hour, set a time limit, come to that, deci- that um, time limit together and say, you know, I'm going to take the baby for one hour. You go do what you want to do. Take a shower, take a bath, take a walk, go out with your girlfriends for an hour, whatever it might be, and commit to it and commit to staying, sticking through that one hour, no matter what the baby throws at you, because she needs that time just to be able to feel human again and to feel like, you know, she can, she is still part, some version of who she once was. <laughs> Because it is when you're in the throes of being a mom to a newborn, you all of a sudden your whole life is revolving around one small, tiny human and that you really still don't know much about. I mean, you're learning all about a new person when you bring a baby home. So, yeah, we call our younger we call our younger daughter Napoleon just because she still is very <laughs> we, we don't have to worry about her being shy. She's very direct and very uh, informed now that she can talk, especially she's very informative about what she needs. <laughs> Which is, is you know, we just have that, to we have to work on the on the way it is is presented, and I make many plenty of mistakes. I mean, there there I've I you know I can't tell you I I make numerous mistakes a day doing that. But there were times when, especially when both kids were very young, I would just throw them both in the car and take take the long way to go to get Starbucks on the way to the park, just uh-huh. give give my wife some time to just like let me you know just chill the f out and maybe watch some bad TV for an hour or so or shower yeah. without having the the kids around it and you know. And yeah, yeah, you got to deal with, with that and, and deal with how to deal with that. Let's come back to fitness now for, does Mama Sagas provide fitness advice for, you know, kind of, and I want to, the one of the questions I want to ask is now that you're a mom, have you kind of changed your thought or your definition about what fitness is or what, what fitness should be? Yes, absolutely. So yeah. So the other thing about where I'm at per- personally right now is that I am taking more of this editorial role in my career now. So I have a lot of time spent at a desk. I'm, you know, I that's new for me. Being a fitness professional, I, I rarely sat down. So now this is kind of a new shift in my own personal lifestyle. And it has, number one, given me a lot of understanding about where my clients um, come from and what they're experiencing on a daily basis. But Number two, um, I think what I've realized, and this is so important for busy parents everywhere, is that the most important thing is movement and varied movement. So that, you know, getting to the gym and doing an hour long workout in the gym every single day is not realistic when you're a parent. It's just not. So especially if you're a working parent. So I think we need to open up our kind of understanding of what it means to be active and to exercise and to be fit. And one of the best things that we can do is to get out there as a family and play, especially now that the weather's going to be starting to get nicer across the country, Um, going out for a family bike ride after dinner, Uh, you know, going to the park. One of the things my husband and I used to do, actually, we have a park that has a track around it and we used to take the baby in the stroller and we would we would alternate. So one of us would push the stroller while the other one did sprints. And then we would sprint ahead for however long, 30 seconds, whatever. And then we'd get down and do like push-ups or box jumps on the park bench or, you know, tricep dips or whatever. And then the other person would uh, at that point catch up and then we'd switch. So then the other person would push the stroller and then the husband, my husband would go off and sprint and so on and so forth. So we would do that for like, you know, 45 minutes at the park and it was a great workout, but you have to get creative and you have to start thinking outside of the gym box, um, for how you're going to get your movement and your fitness in. Well, and, and then- just, just interrupt real quick. I, Cause I, I, I was laughing because my wife and I did the exact same thing of where, <laughs> you know, one person and we would do be at a park where we could do a lap with the stroller. So once somebody would walk a lap and it wasn't like a full track, it just was a sidewalk around the park. While the other mm-hmm. person, I'd have a TRX with me or I'd have a couple of sand yeah. bells or a medicine ball. And, you know, we'd do a little bit of a, of a workout. We'd put together little circuits and take turns doing that as a way to do that. And I still do that with my kids now that they're a little bit bigger. Yep. I'll take a TRX yeah. with me to the playground. And, you know, it's it's not really my full workout, but I'm like, hey, if I'm going to be out there, you know, yes, I get stuck on my phone sometimes while I'm doing that. But I do try to model that behavior about, hey, I'm exercising, exactly. that I want to play too, and that, that I want to be involved with it too. So how is that? I mean, what are, what are some other ways that you've incorporated um, activity in, into the family life? 
One of the things that actually we love, there is a yoga channel called Cosmic Kids Yoga. It's awesome. It is so great. She basically does 30 minute yoga workouts that are all stories. So she tells a story as she leads you through the poses. Is that that on YouTube? Yeah. My kids absolutely love it. Um, she has one that's a frozen, tells a story of frozen. And, um, basically like she tells the story through yoga poses and she's got this cheeky British accent. So she's like (laughs) super fun to listen to and entertaining. The kids love her. My daughter requests to do it like every day. And what's the name of it again? Cosmic Kids Yoga. Cosmic it's Kids fantastic. Yoga on YouTube. I'm yeah. going to definitely, okay, for listeners, I'll yeah. have a link to that below because I definitely, because we've been, my wife and I, and I you, you know me, Sarah Lynn, I wouldn't necessarily yes. call myself a yogi, but I have been trying to, what's really cool, I think, in our school system here, and there was actually a lawsuit a few years ago um, by parents who sued the school system over this, those idiots, but the school has, yeah. you know, teaches yoga as part of the curriculum. And And, you know, the parents were like, I I guess it was like a fundamentalist group who said, you're teaching our kids, you're indoctrinating our kids with Indian religion. It's like, no, this is movement. It's it's meditation. (laughs) It's, and I love the fact that my daughter, I can, I can say a couple of yoga poses to my five-year-old now and she knows how to do them. I mean, I I love that idea of Mm -hmm. cosmic kids yoga. So you guys incorporate that. Yep. So we do that. Um, we also, like I said, we live in Colorado, so we like to get out and hike on the weekends. Um, and we kind of try to build, build it into the lifestyle. And like you said, we want to model it for our kids, but also it, I think, I think of it as doing like double duty. So I want to get a workout in, but I don't want to sacrifice time with my family. So I've got to find ways to be creative. You know, um, I know that for a lot of moms, the fit for mom franchise is really like in uh, so valuable in the first weeks because they do stroller workouts in parks around the country. Um, for me, I also, I have a TRX as well in my house. I use the TRX a lot. We have a pull-up bar in, in our basement. So we have a big basement that we go down even when it's raining or if it's late at night. You know, I'll go down there and I will do my own workout after they go to bed. And, you know, sometimes it's just 30 minutes of Pilates on on the floor in the basement. And that's fine. You know, it's just something. It's getting, it's doing something. And I think the important thing is to remember that, Every, for everything, there is a season. So while this is what it feels like now to get a workout in, that doesn't mean it's going to be like this forever. You know, there's always going to be, we have to be able to be flexible and adaptable in our lifestyle choices to accommodate what our life is demanding of us at that time, at that moment in time. And so for right now, when you're in the throes of early parenting and, you know, you have young kids at home and they're not going to school yet, it's, you have to get creative. Another thing that I'll actually mention too, um, a couple of my colleagues here in the personal training community in Denver started a, an app called Fresh Fitness, hmm. and it's basically um, each day on the app, they deliver two new workouts, and they are workouts that you can do anywhere, um, very minimal equipment required, you know, dumbbells maybe, um, and then a lot of it's body weight training exercises, and so you should check that out as well. I've done that a lot in the basement as well. And, and I think having resources like that is, is a good thing. You know, I've, I've had... Lisa Wheeler on from Daily Burn, and Daily Burn is something that you know my wife has a, sub- a subscription to. Just right. get some exercise ideas and some and some workout ideas. And ha- so, has this changed your definition of fitness? Because I think the one thing that that, that I've tried to do now as as dad is like I want to make fitness less about appearance and more about the message I try to get to my kids. As is more, it's more about health. It's about being active. It's about having fun. Is that an yes. important message to impart upon the family? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I feel like um, for for a long time, so I grew up in a gym. My mom was an aerobics instructor. So I used to go to the the day, like the child care center in the gym for as long as I can remember. By the time I was in middle school, I was taking her step aerobics classes. So for me, I always thought fitness was going to the gym and you do a class or you, you know, or it's a leg day or whatever, you know, yeah. and then, and then all of a sudden I realized that it can't just be that because if it's only that, then we're limiting who can participate in fitness, number one. And we're also limiting, um, you know, the value in, in other things. There is so much to be said about playing with your kids. I mean, you, you think about when we were young and we used to play kick the can outside or we used to go play sharks and minnows. All of those games, they're still playing in preschools. There's no reason why we can't play that with our family, you know playing tag is a great way to get your heart rate up. So I think it just comes down to redefining what fitness means. And, um, also just, you know, 
trying new things with the family, going out and, and going skiing or trying new athletic pursuits. I think that's a really good message to send to our children. And then also for me, fitness is about staying healthy so I can be their mom as long as possible. You know, I don't want to, I don't, it sounds a little, you know, a little sad, but you know, I want to live for a long time. I want to be around to see them do amazing things in this world. And so for me, fitness is about sustainability well, and and that, about, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting just to agree with you there. That that's exactly what what I tell my daughter. I was older. I was I was forty when our first was born. So I'm in my mid forties now, and I tell my daughter that's why I, I, I exercise. I want to stay healthy and be able to play with you, you know, as, as you get older. And and you know, I'll go mountain biking, and she's still working on learning to ride her bike. But I'm like, look, when you get a little bit older, you're going to go mountain biking with me, and yeah, I want to be able yeah. to, you know, I, I want to be able to, to to share that with her. And so this is a question I want to ask because I think this is, is an important thing. Is it okay for a mom to be selfish uh, when it comes to making time for exercise and why? Yeah, I do think it's okay. I think um, it's okay for a mom to be selfish when it comes to making time for herself. And whatever that means for her is whatever that means for her. And for for some moms, that definitely means exercise. And you know, I think it's important that we as moms always take some time for ourselves, not only because it helps, um, helps us feel better, but it actually makes us a better parent because we are, we get out of that trap of resentment. We get out of that trap of feeling like we're only serving, you know, (laughs) dinner to children all day long or cleaning up dishes or whatever it is that you feel. It's important that we have some semblance of who we are as people. So taking time for yourself is a necessity. And for a lot of people, that does mean exercise. But I want to be clear that that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, I think for some people it turns into guilt, like I didn't make it to the gym. And it's not about that. It's about what is it that makes you feel happy, that makes your body feel good, that makes you you feel healthy. And, you know, for, for a lot of moms here in Colorado, like in my group of friends, they'll go for a mama ski day, you know? So it's like, they're not going to the gym to get their exercise. They're going to go, they're going to leave their kids with the grandparents for the day or whatever. And they're going to go take a few runs. So I think it's about finding what it means for you and, and taking that time for yourself. And if it means going to the gym, then great. That's, you know, then do that. But there's lots of different ways to achieve that goal. Well, and, and to get to wrap up the conversation here to, to start bringing it to a close, we had this conversation. We, we had a little chat the other day, Sarah Lynn, and, and this was kind of a fun little thread. What does it mean? I mean, you, you talked about being a fitness instructor. What does it mean to be an instructor? And, and why is it such a, you know, we, we talked about it being hard to step away from, you know, and, and for people that are listening to this, I, I try to appeal to a general consumer audience. And maybe for somebody out there listening who's thought about being a fitness instructor, it doesn't matter if you're a little bit older, you can still learn how to do that. Let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that because you, you've talked about you're looking at making a few changes and starting to teach more. How has it been not teaching after years of yeah. teaching? We'll talk about that a little bit because I think it's so yeah. interesting to hear. Yeah, so I taught full time for 12 years, and then this past year, I've really I've taken a hiatus. And I'm in all fairness, I needed a hiatus. Teaching is an is a it's a mentally, emotionally, and physically draining endeavor because you invest so much of your time and energy and feelings into the people that you're teaching. That's precisely what makes it tiring, but also what makes it so fulfilling because the relationships you develop with people, the fact that you can see the the light bulb go off, the fact that I can help someone understand their body better so that they can make choices, not only in terms of diet and you know lifestyle, but choices in terms of how to stand. Or they'll notice all of a sudden something, you know, something is feeling a little bit tweaky or twingy. And so they'll make a change in how they're standing. And, and they're like, I never would have thought to do that if you hadn't taught me how to properly align myself, you know? And it's those kind of things that that as an instructor, we feed off of because it's like you're making a tangible difference in someone's life, not only in the long term, but in that exact moment when they start to feel that kind of confidence and empowerment in their body, there is nothing like it. So yeah, I am, I'm feeling the itch to get back into teaching again. And even if it's just, you know, a couple hours a week, I need to get back into that teaching environment because it is, it's like kind of, you get addicted to it. You like to help people. You're, you're there as a service to other people. And it's just, there's nothing like making that kind of positive impact in someone's life. 
And, and how do, does it, don't the classes sort of develop their own community? You know, have mm-hmm. you have you noticed that over the years that that you know you try to do some things, but they always develop their their own community. That's that you know how cool yeah. is that to see? Yeah, the classes develop their own community, and then also when you're working one on one with someone. I mean, some of my clients I worked one on one with twice a week for you know five years. That's more than I saw some of my best friends. You become you become you become very close to those people, and you stay in touch with them, and and you you know bring them gifts when they have children, and and it's all those it's all of that. It's that interpersonal relationship, and that's again going back to one of the first questions you asked me. That's why it's so important to have that kind of um, community in your life. You know, when you're a parent, it's important. Fitness can give you that. It can give you that community. It can give you that sense of um, belonging and support that you so need as a new parent. And now I want to, you know, to wrap it up, you, you've received a couple of awards and recognitions. What's that mean? You're, you're honored with a gold medal uh, by the Parenting Media <laughs> Association. You know, what is that? How does that, you know, what's that mean to you in terms of the work that you're doing? It's, I, I, I'm honestly like speechless when I think about it. Um, and it almost brings me to tears because I think what I try to do with my writing and my media work is take what I loved about teaching and just apply it to a bigger audience. So, you know, it's wonderful to have that impact one-on-one with people, but when you can be on TV and have that, you know, you have that audience of thousands of people. And if you can give them that same empowering information that you give to your clients one-on-one, the impact you have is so much greater. And to be honored with an award like that was like very, it just was amazing. It's affirming. It, It helps me realize that the work that I'm doing is needed and that moms and even dads are, you know, happy to, happy to take, take some of that information I'm giving them and apply it in their lives. And that's really, that's all I can ask. That makes and, me happy. And you've evolved, you do a little bit of TV work uh, regularly, right? On one of the morning shows there in Denver. What, what do, do you do? And, 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 you know, how does that, you know, how'd that come about? Um, well, I, so I, I do a parenting segment, um, usually twice a month here on the everyday show in Denver. And it came about because to be quite honest with you, I, I had done some things in TV and I started the mama sagas and I was like, I really want to get this message out to more moms. So I reached out to a friend who knew the producers on the show. They brought me in to do a trial run and, um, they kept me on ever since. And then it has started to get more frequent. So it's just been a great opportunity. And I feel like I've grown on the air with them. They've, they've given me so many opportunities to talk about things that I wish I had information about when I was a new mom. And so, you know, we did, I did a self-assessment for diastasis on, on the air. And I had so many people reach out to me after that saying, i think I have this and I never knew before, what do I do? And that was so rewarding. And just, it, you know, like I said, it takes that message of teaching and just broadcasts it to a bigger audience. And what do you have, what do you have coming up? I mean, aren't you putting together uh, an ebook and and what's that going to cover? Yes. So we're doing, uh, the Mama Sagas is launching an ebook in June called the New Mom Survival Guide. It will also contain a directory of nationwide practitioners who who serve women in that postpartum period. And the goal of the book is really to collect all of these resources for moms in one place. So it's going to be pelvic floor physical therapists and diastasis rehab experts and pediatricians and OBGYNs and infant sleep experts and lactation consultants, formula feeding experts, basically any any kind of resource that a new mom might need in that first year, we're going to put into this ebook. It will be sold online um, for a small fee and a a dollar of each sale will go to every mother counts because I think it's important to give back. And um, I'm super excited about it. We've got some great people on board. um, And I think that it's going to lead to even more wonderful things and opportunities for women to really learn about their bodies in a new way. That's awesome. I think that's it's such an amazing thing. And I think it's so cool to see you using the different media and all the things. Because cause think about this, Sarah Lynn, even as much as, you know, 10 years ago, which isn't really that long ago, you didn't have this ability to connect with other new exactly. moms and, and to share the experience. Has social media been a part of, been, been a part of this experience for you? Um, and, and do you Huge. think that can be, be beneficial? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I think, you know, for as much as we groan about certain aspects of social media, social media is 
an opportunity for us to get a message out as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, and to as many people as possible in a fast way. So, I mean, social media has definite upside to it. And, and it has allowed us to connect in a way that we couldn't connect before. And, you know, for as much as we are so connected digitally these days, I think moms in particular have a, a new type of isolation that they're feeling because we don't have, we used to have intergenerational communities that we lived with essentially, you know, and we don't have that anymore. A lot of us move far away from where we grew up. We don't have those tight knit communities anymore that can help us. So we don't have those kind of resources at our fingertips to ask questions that come up in those, you know, first months and weeks of being a parent. And those questions that we have can feel so immediate. And so every mom needs to have a resource, a, a, some sort of support group or resource that she can go to with those questions. What I wanted to do with the Mama Sagas and with this ebook is to provide that so that, you know, we if, if we are so connected digitally now, that's where the village now has to live. We have to move the village for parents to a digital platform. And so that's what we're trying to do. That is such a cool thing. And it's so ironic that, you know, after, you know, a couple of years of, of having kids and everything, um, you know, we kind of had to deal with that. We didn't have family in the area in San Diego. But now that our kids are a little bit older, both of my parents, uh, and they've been divorced for a number of years, have recently retired to the San Diego area. So actually, as we talk, my uh, daughter's with uh, my mother, <laughs> <Yep>. my <laughs> younger daughter, because her daycare is closed. And, and I have to tell you, it really is. It, it really is. Um, I think it's it's a blessing to be able to have them in our in our lives now. I wasn't that <laughs> close with my grandparents. And it really is just a, a huge thing that, that I never realized how important it was. But now, just seeing my kids interact with my parents is really kind of a is really kind of a cool thing. And uh, yeah. do you are, do you have that opportunity you have- with your parents? No. Well, my so we live in Colorado, but all of my family is on the East Coast, and the same with my husband. So we are very far from family. So I think that's part of the reason why I ended up starting the Mama Sagas is because I really was out here by myself, you know, and as soon as, you know, dad goes back to work, you all of a sudden are like home with this newborn. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know who to ask. You know, it's like, what do I do now? So I remember the very moment I had the the concept of the Mama Sagas was at 3 a.m. I was, I had a baby who had reflux. And so she was very fussy and very uncomfortable. And I just remember thinking, who can I call right now? I, my pediatrician's not going to be there. You know, <laughs> like I don't, ha- I can't call my lactation consultant. What do I do? I wish there was something that I could access from my phone and get some answers. And so here I am fast forward five years later and I'm making it happen. <laughs> that is such an awesome story. And I'm glad that glad we're finished up. So Sarah Lynn Ward of the Mama Sagas, I'm going to have uh, the contact information down below. Do you have, uh, besides your, your, your blog, do you have like social media that people can contact? Yeah, absolutely. So you can reach out to me on Facebook, of course, LinkedIn with well, Mama Sagas is on Instagram and Twitter as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Sarah Lynn. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Pete. It's been a pleasure. First, if you enjoyed episode 108 with Sarah Lynn Ward, where we talk about the Mama Sagas blog, and if you listen to episode 107 with Shauna Verstegen, where we talk about how she's managed to stay fit between you know, having a young child and getting ready to have her second child, you may also want to take a moment and listen to a couple of my early podcasts. On episode 14, I interview a good friend, Amy Nicotera, who talks about how you can exercise during pregnancy. Now, two things about Amy was when we recorded, Amy was was 40, and we share that on the recording, but within about 12 hours of recording that interview, actually, Amy gave birth to her son, so it was kind of interesting, but we go, Amy does a great job of talking about the benefits of exercise for, for pregnant women. Episode 15 of All About Fitness is with Lisa Druxman and Farrell Hruska of Fit for Mom, a community that started Stroller Strides, they have Body Back, they have a number of different programs for women who just recently have kids. So as someone who obviously is a parent myself and has been very active in fitness for a number of years, I really recognize the role that exercise plays, not only in health, but in just in building community and fostering community. You know, right after, you know, we had our kids, my, my wife had done a terrific job. You know, first of all, when she was pregnant teaching group fitness, she got to meet a few of the women in her class who were also pregnant. And they they formed they formed friendships that have have you know been really important and been a critical part of being a parent of young kids. And you know what I'm talking about, where 
you get together and you work out. And yeah, it's a little bit about the activity, but you know the deal, man. When you got a young kid pulling on you, yelling, you know, especially when they're really young and they can't verbalize, they can't talk. Sometimes you just need that social interaction with other adults. And my wife would do that. She would organize, you know, walking, you know, they'd go for walks around Balboa Park in San Diego with three or four women from the health club she was teaching at the time. And it became a very important part of that. So part of what I want to do with, with this blog, or not this isn't a blog, this is a podcast, right? I'm speaking into a little microphone. I'm not typing. One of the things I want to be able to do with this podcast is highlight some of the ways that exercise plays a role in our life. You know, traditionally, we think of exercise, we got to lose weight, we got to look a certain way, but I'm trying to highlight how exercise can actually enhance our life from other points of view, meaning how can we build community? How can we develop friendships? You know, as you heard Sarah and Lynn and I talk about, one of the, it's the most amazing thing about being a fitness instructor. If you are a fitness instructor, if you are a trainer, you know what I'm talking about, where it's almost like an addiction, right? There aren't too many jobs out there where people look forward to seeing you in the day. You know, if I'm teaching a group fitness class, I'm very well aware that if you're coming to my class, you're giving me an hour of your time. And I owe it to you to make that hour special, to make that hour beneficial. And you really, it does become a rush. You know, there, there have been a couple of periods in my career where I haven't taught a class for, you know, for a period of time for whatever reason. And, and you miss it. It really is. You know, Sarah and I talk about that a little bit, where, where you miss that opportunity because you're having a positive impact on people. And for those of you who take classes, if you're not a fitness professional, understand that you play a very important role every time you show up in that class. You do. You are there. You're there in that class. And, and you don't realize the power that vicarious experiences have. And what I mean by that is if you're a young parent yourself, and there might be a new woman in that class who's coming back to, to her first you know, exercise class after giving birth. Or maybe, you know, you're coming back to that class and somebody's going through a shared experience. One of the most powerful things that happens in group fitness is people are looking around and seeing other people like them being successful. And it's a little, for me, you know, I, I like sharing some ideas on parenthood. I like I like having guests on like Shauna and, and, and Sarah Lynn and Amy and Lisa Druxman. I like having those guests on to share ideas, but understand this. None of us, none of us are doing parenthood perfectly, <laughs> All right? I can guarantee that. There, there aren't too many guarantees in the world, but I can guarantee that absolutely none of us are doing parenthood perfectly. We're all trying to get through each day. I heard, uh, I heard somebody talking about that on a, on a radio show I listened to where sometimes with a young kid, you're just trying to get through that next year, trying to get through that next two hours. Let me get them to the park. Whew, okay, got that. All right, let me go take them on, let's do some shopping. Whew, got that. Let's get them to bed. You know, so none of us are doing parenthood perfectly. We're trying to get through. We're trying just to, to make it work. And, and I really, I chafe at that because you see so many different people out there. You got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. Folks, the only thing we have to do perfectly with parenthood <laughs> is we put them to bed at night and we wake them up, wake them up in the morning. That, that's about the only perfect thing we can do. We're going to make mistakes along the way. What we want to do, though, is make sure we make the right mistakes and that we learn from our, our mistakes. I've had coaches tell me, I've had bosses tell me, you know what, mistakes can be acceptable, but what's not acceptable is repeating, repeating the same mistake twice. And I love that quote. You know, you're going to make mistakes, but just don't make the same mistake twice. Learn from your mistakes. And that's what parenthood is. Parenthood is we're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. You know, there, there are so many things I enjoy about being a parent. And there are, you know, so many things that really it's like, oh, my God, I did not realize how tough it would be. No wonder, you know, for all those for all those of you out there whose parents are like, when are you going to have a kid? When are you going to have a kid? No wonder our parents want us to have kids. They want us to go through the same experience we put them through. On this episode, hopefully you got uh, something out of that conversation with Sarah Lynn Ward. I, I got to know Sarah Lynn a little bit through a project we both worked on a few years ago. And like a lot of people you know, in the industry, we connected through social media. And over the past few years, I've been really impressed with what she's done. She's a media spokesperson. You, you heard her talk about that. She has a couple of regular segments in Denver, her local market. And I, I watch some of her segments sometimes when she posts them on her Facebook page. And she's been somebody who's really, really, I've noticed, I've, you know, she's caught my eye. And, and she's done some great work. She's doing some great work. She's very professional. She's very outgoing. She, and she's doing a good job of building a community around being a mother, 
around being a parent. And she and I were talking about that a little bit too, you know, is can't do dads. Do we have the same thing? I, and it's funny. I just think guys, we, we, we bond and we connect in a different way with other guys, you know, and, and I don't think we, um, I think for women, and I don't know, maybe I should pull my foot out of my mouth right now, um, or put my foot in my mouth right now, but I think women, there's a tendency to be more community based in their efforts around things like that, where guys, it's always like, oh, I, I can handle this. I can do it myself. There have been times where I've been in a store with both kids blowing up and somebody's like, do you want to handle it? I'm like, no, 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 I got this. You know, I got stuff everywhere. I got one kid with a wet diaper, another kid having a meltdown. But uh, no, I don't need any help. I got that. I, I think that's a, I think that's a little bit of difference where, you know, sometimes, um, you know, women might look out and, and, and look to support one another and, and accept that support. And that's what Sarah Lynn is trying to do. She's trying to create an online community where people are there to support each other and root one another on. And if I can give a little bit of voice to that, if I can help her get a little exposure, if you haven't paid attention to the Mama Sagas yet, if you haven't followed Sarah Lynn Ward, I really recommend it. She's doing some really cool stuff, and she's a, a terrific per- person doing just some great work in the fitness industry. So this ends it. You know, last episode 107 was Sean over Stegan talking about again being a being a parent or, and, and you know exercising when you when you're pregnant and having a young kid. And Sarah Lynn Ward, you know, episode 108, we're talking about you know just the role that community plays in motherhood. So that's my little mo- that's you know my little break from Mother's Day. I'm gonna get back some regular programming as always. I'm working really hard. Um, I've been you know, reaching out to some people. I'm trying to get outside of my existing network. You know, I know, know a lot of fitness educators. I know a lot of folks in fitness. And I'm kind of trying to reach out and, and look other areas where I can bring people in and just learn all about fitness. If you're enjoying this podcast, if, if you like listening to it, first of all, for those of you that have given a review, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And if you haven't given me, you know, if you haven't given me a review, why not? <laughs> you know how this works. If you can take a moment to give me a review, you know you know how this works. The more reviews you get, the higher up the search rankings you go. So all, you know, all I need is just you, you, if you listen to me regularly, if you listen to this podcast regularly, please do take a moment and just uh, let other people know about it so that uh, more people can find out about this. And we can all, all I'm trying to do is, is help people learn how to use fitness and exercise to improve and enhance their quality of life. If you want to connect with me, my Twitter handle is PeteMC underscore fitness. That's PeteMC underscore fitness. My Instagram tag is Pete McCall underscore fitness. That's Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. You can reach out to me there. You can also follow my blog, PeteMcCallFitness.com. I don't update that as much as I should. I do a lot more blogging for the American Council on Exercise and 24-Hour Fitness. Uh, 24 Life is the online magazine of 24-Hour Fitness, and I do a lot of content development and blogging for them. And I just haven't taken that time to, you know, I'll do it for others, but I haven't taken the time to uh, develop my own blog. You can always contact me, Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. That's Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. If you have any feedback, you want some follow-up about one of the experts that we've had on the show, um, by all means, reach out. Or if you have any suggestions for people I should be talking to, please, I've gotten some of those and I'm working through them. So thank you. Keep them coming. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by this episode of All About Fitness. I look forward to having you join me for future shows.